Hey students, this lesson is all about how cells receive signals. We'll focus on how those signals cause a, cause a response in the target cell in a future video. This is a layout of our discussion. First, we will learn about how receptors respond to a specific chemical messenger. We will then take a look at what happens to a signal receptor when it binds to a signaling molecule. So it turns out that different receptors recognize different chemical messengers. It would be pretty awful if, instead of just a woman's uterus contracting when her pituitary gland releases oxytocin, her whole body contracted. It's only the cells with a matching receptor that will bind to and respond to any given signaling molecule. After we explore this idea in more detail, we'll examine the two major types of signal receptors. Ligand is another word for signaling molecule. The shape, to, the shape of a ligand must match the shape of a protein receptor so they, they can bind together like puzzle pieces. When they bind, this triggers a shape change in the protein receptor, also known as a conformational change. So as discussed earlier, cells only hear signals for which they have a complementary receptor. This first cell would not respond to hormone B, which, it's, which is shaped like a triangle, because it only has receptors that are shaped uh, circular and are complementary to hor hormone A. The last cell would only respond to hormone B because it only has receptors that are triangular shaped and not receptors that are circular shaped. However, the cell in the middle would respond to both signaling molecules. It would respond to both hormone A and hormone B because it has both types of receptors. This image illustrates how binding to a ligand triggers a shape in the protein receptor. The kind of conformational change you get depends on the type of protein receptor. This particular receptor here is known as a ligand-gated ion channel. When the ligand binds to the receptor, that triggers a shape change which enables ions to enter or leave a cell. There are two types of signal receptors. Both are proteins. One type of receptor is found inside a cell and is known as an intracellular receptor. The other type of receptor is found embedded in the plasma membrane. In order for a signaling molecule, or ligand, to bind to an intracellular receptor, it has to get into the cell. This means the ligand must be either lipid-soluble and or very small, like steroids and the gas nitrous oxide. These sorts of ligands, because they're small and nonpolar, can cross the phospholipid bilayer and bind to an intracellular receptor within the cell. When the ligand binds to an intracellular receptor, we call that an activated ligand receptor complex. This ligand receptor complex can then enter the nucleus and turn on or turn off genes, which in turn influences gene expression and what proteins the cell makes. So you can see here this red thing is a ligand. It's able to enter the cell through the plasma membrane because it's lipid soluble or nonpolar and it's really small. It binds to this receptor. This is called our activated ligand receptor complex and then that ligand receptor complex can then in turn turn on or turn off different genes. The other type of receptor is embedded in the plasma membrane. Water-soluble ligands cannot enter the cell by diffusing across the phospholipid bilayer because they're polar, and the lipid tails of the phospholipids will repel them. Instead, water-soluble ligands bind to protein receptors embedded in the plasma membrane. This binding of a ligand to a protein receptor causes the receptor to change shape. This conformational change will then trigger, the, trigger other changes within the cell, thereby transmitting information inside of the cell. So again, we have our red ligand. This time it's water soluble. It cannot pass directly through the phospholipid bilayer. Instead, it binds to a protein receptor that's embedded in the plasma membrane. When the ligand binds the protein receptor, that triggers a conformational change or shape change in the protein receptor, which then triggers other changes within the cell. There are three main types of membrane receptors. We have G-protein linked receptors, receptor tyrosine kinases, and ligand gated ion channels. A G-protein linked receptor is simply a protein found in the cell membrane that is associated or hangs out with a G-protein. When a ligand binds to the receptor protein, the receptor changes shape and activates the G-protein. The G-protein in turn activates an enzyme. The G-protein is like a switch for the signal. The G protein is off when it's attached to GDP, and the G protein is on when it's attached to GTP. Here's an illustration of a G protein linked receptor. The red teardrop shaped molecule is the ligand, and the purple molecule 
is a receptor embedded in the plasma membrane. It's a G protein linked receptor because it's associated or is hanging out with this green G protein. When the ligand binds the receptor protein, this triggers a change in the receptor protein shape, which then causes the receptor protein to add a GTP to the G protein. This fully activates the G protein, which then slides down the plasma membrane and in turn activates an enzyme that's also embedded in the plasma membrane. Receptor tyrosine kinases are a different type of receptor found in the plasma membrane. They are special because they can trigger multiple signal transduction pathways at once. A kinase is an enzyme that adds phosphates to other molecules. This is called phosphorylation. When a molecule gets phosphorylated, it usually becomes activated. So by adding phosphates to other things, a kinase can activate other molecules. Before a ligand binds to a receptor tyrosine kinase, these receptor tyrosine kinases are found separate, embedded in the plasma membrane, and they're inactive. So let's discuss how this works. Our ligand will first bind to the receptor portion of each, of each tyrosine kinase. So it binds to the receptor part that kind of pokes out into the cytoplasm. This will cause the two tyrosine kinases to hook together, and this is called dimerize. So when they're attached together, they're called a dimer. So now let's discuss how it works. The ligand or signaling molecule will bind to the receptor portion of each tyrosine kinase, or the part that actually pokes out onto the cytoplasm. When the ligand binds, this causes the two tyrosine kinases to attach to one another or to dimerize. So when they're hooked together, they're called a dimer. This partially activates the receptor tyrosine kinases. The tyrosine kinases will start adding phosphates to each other. This fully activates them. The fully active tyrosine kinases are now able to bind to and activate other proteins in the cell by adding phosphates to them or by phosphorylating them. And these activated proteins will in turn cause various cell responses. Here's a diagram showing how receptor tyrosine kinases work. The two purple molecules are your receptor tyrosine kinases. They have a receiving end which pokes out of the cell, out of the plasma membrane, and then they have their kinase end which pokes into the cytoplasm. Here they are separate and inactive. When the complementary signaling molecule or ligand binds to the signal binding site, that causes the two separate receptor tyrosine kinases to bind together or to dimerize. So we call this a dimer. This partially activates the receptor tyrosine kinases. The partially active receptor tyrosine kinases now use their kinases to add phosphates to the tyrosine across from it. So this one will um, add a phosphate to this one, and this one will add a phosphate to this one, and so on, until the dimer is fully active. Now the dimer will use its phosphates to phosphorylate or add phosphates to other relay proteins within the cell. Once the relay proteins have a phosphate added to them by the receptor tyrosine kinase, they can carry along the message into the cell. And since there are so many kinases on the receptor, a receptor tyrosine kinase can activate a whole bunch of relay, relay proteins in a short amount of time. Finally, we have ligand-gated ion channels. They're just a protein channel that acts as a gate to either let ions in or keep them out. When a ligand binds to the receptor protein, the gate either opens or closes, affecting the flow of a specific ion. When a ligand unbinds the receptor, or comes off, then the gate goes back to its inactive position. Here's an example of a ligand-gated ion channel. Before the ligand binds to the receptor, the ion channel is closed, and so this particular ion cannot flow into or out of the cell. Once the ligand attaches to the receptor, the ion channel opens, allowing a particular ion to diffuse into or out of the cell. Okay, I know that's a lot. Please rewind and review as you need. Thanks for watching.